I'm optimistic about it. And, and the things that make me optimistic basically are more regulatory clarity um, in the U.S. and globally, which I think could could help a ton. Um, and institutional adoption. And it's needed to do mandates for certain reasons. Let's adjust and do so, and then we'll come back around. But this is the new reality that we must face. Our city and school system must open. Despite uh, this massive uh, case explosion with Omicron, uh, the United States, Europe, the developed world is going to feel much more normal, finally, uh, within weeks. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The U.S. hits a record one million virus cases in a single day, the most any country has reported since the pandemic actually began. Balancing Act, OPEC Plus meets today with a group set for another boost to output. And convicted, Elizabeth Holmes is found guilty of defrauding Theranos investors. Now, first of all, let's check on the markets. So we do see a little bit of volatility back. I've been going through some of the notes of a lot of the banks, and of course, of focus firmly on inflation this year, Fed tapering, whether that leads to tantrum, and on China. The million-dollar question, is it going to be much more difficult in 2022 to make money in the markets than it was in 2021? For the moment, we're seeing a nice liftoff. For example, the FTSE here in the UK gaining over 1%, and the European stocks uh, six-tenths of a percent higher. The couple of other things we're watching for, so we're also seeing a lift to some of these U.S. futures, and then iron ore over in Singapore, 122. The story, of course, is on oil and a lot of these raw material prices as well. Let's get onto the European map. A couple of things we also need to watch out in China. I know we just heard from Ian Bremmer. He was really talking about the fact that we're underestimating uh, the zero COVID policy in China and what that means for closures and what that means for the rest of the world. You can see over here in the UK, 1.3% higher for that stock and then the FTSE maybe in Italy gaining four tenths of a percent. So on to the latest Omicron news and more than 1 million people in the US were diagnosed with COVID-19 on Monday. The record number of cases is the highest figure recorded by any country for a single day by a large margin. Let's bring in uh, Tim Law from our healthcare team. Tim, huge numbers from the US, but it seems that it doesn't translate into higher hospitalizations and this is on a number of trials how can we be certain about that yeah well it's still early goings um, the experience the real world experience in South Africa is promising a lot of the scientific studies that are emerging looking at the virus in the lab is promising um, so that means that very likely the the it's a different dynamic when it comes to case numbers versus hospitalizations. The risk, though, is that given the sheer number of infections happening, one million in the U.S. in a day, you're still going to get a lot of more infections. New York State is a kind of bellwether on this, and hospitalizations are going up there um, to you know, higher numbers than they've been in a long time. So. To some extent, there's going to be, yeah. um, we're going to have to still wait and see, but the uh, early data is promising compared to previous variants. Tim, do we know, you know, if Omicron, which if it turns out to be less severe and it displaces Delta, could we be nearer the end of the pandemic sooner than we think? That's the... That's the bull case. That's what people are hoping, and, and it, there's definitely an argument for that. One thing, of course, over the course of the past two years, surprises have come all at all turns. So we don't know what the future holds in completely. New variants could emerge. There could be some sort of a recombination between Delta and Omicron. But it's all against the backdrop of increased population immunity as people get their booster shots and as get infected. So those are all promising trajectories. So there is reason to hope. All right, let's hope. Let's start optimistically and hope for the best. Our healthcare reporter over there, Tim Lowe. Now, let's also talk about the other main story today. And OPEC and its allies are poised to revive more oil production when they meet today after giving a tighter outlook for global markets. Now, delegates say the 23-nation alliance is on track to ratify another modest output revival of 400,000 barrels a day. Well, joining us now with the preview is Paul Wallace. He's team leader for our energy and commodities coverage in the Middle East. But today, he's here with us in London. Paul, welcome to London. So what exactly are you expecting from OPEC Plus? 
Hi, Francine. We're expecting a pretty smooth and straightforward uh, meeting today or the, uh, this afternoon Vienna time when OPEC Plus uh, meets. As you mentioned, uh, most traders and analysts expect it to agree to raise crude production by 400,000 barrels a day next month. So if it goes ahead and does that, it would be very much a continuation um, of its policy over the last few months. It's essentially um, having to to balance uh, its needs with those of major oil uh, importers at the moment. 400,000 barrels a day um, uh, would actually be quite a modest increase. So it wants to put enough oil on the market to meet um, rising demand. But at the same time, it doesn't uh, want oil prices to drop much further than here. OPEC would very much um, be happy if oil stays around $75, $80 a barrel. And no, yeah. it doesn't go below that. And Paul, I know we need to look at compliance. We also have a great chart actually done by our Valerie. Oil uh, has risen even as OPEC plus increases uh, production. Most analysts in OPEC itself see the oil market now switching from a supply deficit to a surplus this quarter. You know, how much extra pressure will that put on prices? That's, that's a very big question. Um, OPEC itself sees a, surplus of, a supply surplus of about 1.4 million barrels a day in the first quarter of this year, and it thinks that surplus will actually rise uh, even, even further in the second quarter. So certainly that could put downward uh, pressure on, on oil prices. Some other analysts see an even bigger surplus, and they point to China, and you, 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 know, you mentioned a few moments ago the zero COVID policy, and uh, that in China alone could, uh, could cause quite a big uh, f um, fall in, in oil demand um, but from OPEC Plus's thinking they think they've done a lot of the hard work over the past 18 months since the start of the pandemic and oil inventories globally are now quite far below historical levels so they think that even if the market's in surplus for a while um, inventories are starting from a low base so they're not too worried about that. Paul thank you so much Paul Wallace there of course from our Bloomberg team looking at OPEC plus and the price of oil now coming up new year new records we speak to Andrew Pease he's global head of investment strategy at Russell Investments to get his calls as 2021 ended with huge gains in the US plus convicted Elizabeth Holmes faces up to 20 years in prison for defrauding Theranos investors we'll discuss that later in the program this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacque here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The UAE is said to be at risk of being placed on a list of countries subject to more oversight for short shortcomings of combating money laundering and terrorist financing. Bloomberg has learned the Financial Action Task Force is leaning towards adding the country to its grey list earlier this year. If approved, it would be among the most significant steps in the global watchdog's history, given the UAE's position as the main financial hub of the Middle East. Now, now, Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes has been found guilty of criminal fraud over the collapse of a $9 billion blood testing company. A U.S. federal jury convicted Holmes on four counts of the 11 she'd been charged with. The 37-year-old now faces up to 20 years in prison. She's expected to appeal her conviction and any sentence she does get. Hong Kong is to require people to have at least one COVID-19 vaccine shot to enter restaurants and public leisure facilities from late February. The government is pushing back its plans until after the Lunar New Year holidays to allow businesses to prepare and to give the city time to roll out vaccines to the one million or so people still without the first dose. Bloomberg's been told the White House is likely to nominate economist Philip Jefferson for a seat on the Fed Board of Governors. He would be just the fourth black man to hold the position in the central bank's more than 100-year history. Jefferson is an economics professor at Davidson College in North Carolina and has worked at the Fed twice before. The New York Attorney General has subpoenaed Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump Jr. as part of the state's investigation into their father 
father's business dealings. Attorney General Letitia James is examining whether the former president's real estate business manipulated the value of key assets for tax and insurance purposes. Trump sued James last month, giving the investigation, and he also said it was politically motivated. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now let's get straight to the markets as global COVID cases hit fresh records. The U.S. hit a million cases yesterday. We're now joined by Andrew Pease, Global Head of Investment Strategy at Russell Investments and by Christina Kino from our FX and Rates team. Thank you both for joining us. Christine, we were having this conversation before. It's not really about Omicron, which the market seems to be looking through it, but what they're focused on is really inflation, you know, t Fed tapering and what that means for possible tantrums. And then they look at China. What's the story today? Absolutely, Francine. I think it is very much that inflation fear being front and center in markets. And we know this from various surveys last year, right? I think this is front and center in terms of the big risk for investors in 2022. And I think the way that investors are thinking about the Omicron situation at the moment is kind of uh, a tail risk to some of the big base views for 2022. It's certainly something that isn't necessarily going away anytime soon, especially when we're getting headlines such as U.S. cases hitting records. But at the same time, I think investors are very measured in terms of taking this into account for their investment decisions. I think at the moment, a lot of investors are taking a look at um, hospitalizations and potential risk for lockdowns. And so long as those things are remaining minimal at this point, then I think it's, it's likely to stay a side risk while they focus on the inflation question for 2022. Yeah, inflation for left, right and center. Andrew, how much more difficult will it to be, you know, be making money in equities in 2022 compared to last year? Of course, after three years of pretty strong double-digit gains for U.S. markets, it's obviously going to be more complicated. And now that the Fed has signaled its intention to start moving away from these highly accommodative policy settings, that adds the difficulties as well. But the old strategist golden rule, you don't start to get bearish until the Fed gets serious, and the Fed's a long way from getting serious. So even if the Fed is raising rates this year, it's going to be taking away accommodation rather than really stamping on the brakes. So I think in that context, it still looks likely to be a year in which which equities should be the best performing asset class. Um, Andrew, let me bring you to a chart which I thought, you know, was very telling in terms of the Treasury yield surge that we actually saw yesterday. How much more volatility are you expecting in the fixed income space? And how will that play out to what equities will do? That's right. And, like, it's always a bit of a truism when people talk about the outlook to say that it's going to be more volatile. But certainly, as we get into this inflection point in monetary policy, that does add to the risk in volatility as well. Now, one of the big question marks for 2022 is how far do Treasury yields rise? Because it does seem that most asset classes are very deeply linked to the level of long-term interest rates. And that's certainly been one of the big bullish factors in recent years. And that could unwind. But I do think that is going to be quite limited. I expect that inflation will be coming down as we go through the year. I think that if the Fed does start moving on rates, it's going to move very, very slowly. And these things will mean that we get a fairly limited rise in Treasury yields. So they might go towards 2% as we go through the year, but I wouldn't be expecting to see a surge in Treasury yields through this year. Yeah, and certainly yesterday, I mean, I think it was one of the biggest moves since 2009 to the start of the year. And you can see that beautiful chart uh, taking it back to 2019. Christine, I know you're also looking at yen. What does that tell us about what's ahead? Absolutely, Francine. And I think it really will be all about the velocity now when it comes to yields, right? And that's certainly something that investors are going to be watching out for. At the moment, we're already seeing bets for the 10-year Treasury yield to hit 1.95% by February. That's about a 30-odd basis point increase from current levels. And so the question is, how fast do we get there, right? And so if, if we see that happening uh, over the next month, that would be the biggest uh, monthly increase for Treasury yields since March of last year. So pretty significant there. And so I think it's just a matter of, you know, is that uh, velocity really going to pick up between now and then? And are we likely to see these um, yields, which are generally expected to go higher this year, are we likely to see that happening much earlier than people are expecting? I think that's the key, key question here. Um, when's your, the, the one thing, Andrew, that you want to be highly invested in? What's your boldest and bravest call for 2022? A boldest and bravest call. That's a challenging one. <laughs> like, it was that or your resolution? 
<laughs> I think as a general rule, it does. It's still we're still in the regimes in which um, um, equities will outperform bonds. If I'm going to make a bold call, a contrarian call, I think if you want to be contrarian this year, the place to be contrarian is to buy Chinese equities because particularly offshore equities, the ones that got absolutely hammered last year that everyone hates. And if China does really start to put, put some reasonable stimulus into its economy as we go through, it may not pace off straight away, but I would say that's probably the one area that looks the most interesting from a purely contrarian perspective. Okay, I like that contrarian perspective. Christine, I mean, I think, you know, probably the, the chart of the next quarter is this one here, looking at the Fed liftoff in March as taper ends. What will give the market more anxiousness? Is it really what the Fed does, although it's been flagged pretty highly, or is it what, you know, happens with China and COVID cases? I think it would be that tension between what the Fed is doing and what China is doing, right? I think this, this divergence in monetary policy where we see the world's largest central bank heading towards tightening while the world's second largest central bank heading towards easing is going to be very, very interesting to watch. I think Andrew's absolutely right. You know, if we do see more of that supportive environment in China, there's absolutely a case for um, the contrarian view of, of more positive Chinese equities coming through because investors, of course, really loving that support um, from central banks, particularly in, in equity markets. And so if we really see that divergence come through this year, I think there's going to be some very interesting plays to be had there and potentially uh, some some upside to be had, uh, particularly in Chinese assets as we head into this year. Great. Thank you both for joining us. Christina Kino and Andrew Pease, Global Head of Investment Strategy at Russell Investments, stays with us. Now, coming up, hitting $3 trillion, Apple's valuation soars after a pandemic-fueled boom. We'll take a look at that a little bit later in the program. This is Bloomberg. Twenty twenty two. Twenty twenty two. Kicking off uh, twenty twenty two. Happy New Year. Twenty twenty one is now in our rearview mirror. Not really. The problem is going to be the story of twenty one. The same questions and concerns. Because we have inflation. The market's clearly worried about it. Will it come down fast enough to keep, prevent the Fed from going for rate hikes? We have a very aggressive Fed this year. If the inflation super overheats, it's going to force the Fed's hand. Very very critical for market outcomes next year. We've had uh, three years in a row of double digits for the S&P 500. We continue to see the market still being strong. Then I think we start to have a little bit more concern. And Make sure that you keep your fear contained. Have a flexible mind. Humility is very critical. Well, some of the guests there as the S&P 500 start the year with a new record high. Let's get straight to Andrew Pease from Russell Investments, who's still with us. Andrew, I know you prefer some of the non-U.S. equities to U.S. equities, although it's not necessarily the emerging market stocks that you're looking at. Let's get a great chart actually looking at the deferential over, I think, the last year on the Bloomberg terminal. And, Andrew, I think my question to you is that you like some of the non-U.S. because it's a move away from some of the expensive technological stocks. But then you look at Apple. It passed three trillions in valuation. I mean, what comes next? No, it's, it's, it's been amazing how those tech stocks have performed. And this has been sort of a view that I thought should have played out last year. Last year, when we're coming out of the, really the, the, the first stage of the big recoveries, normally when these value cyclical stocks, financial, should perform. And they did really well after the vaccine announcement, up until we got the Delta variant announcement. And then we had the pullback in Treasury yields and tech stocks took off again. And the question for 2022, is it really just being delayed or is it not going to happen that we get this rebound in cyclicals? And remember, Europe is financials, Europe is value, Europe is cyclicals. U.S. is tech and healthcare, essentially. So U.S. is essentially a growth market. So the question for 2022 is, can we have that happen? And I think we can. Right. I think there's good growth upside in Europe. I think that as yield yeah. curves start to re deepen, as we've already seen, that is very correlated with value outperformance, and it should hold back some of those long-duration tech stocks. And, Andrew, what do, you do with, what do you do with high yield right now? Well, I think you have to stay... like. 
in a relative call, high yield over IG. High yield does look better. You're getting a better yield pickup. But I think with high yield, the best you're going to get this year is clipping coupon. And this is a problem across the fixed income complex in general. So fixed income in general doesn't look like a great place to be. Within fixed income, high yield is probably the place to be. You want to keep some, 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 some government bond diversification properties into your portfolio. But I think, you know, high yield looks to be the best place in the... In the um, in the fixed income complex right now, so I stay with it. But I would be, I wouldn't be that bullish about what it's going to give you, other than just that yield pick up. Andrew, thank you so much for all of the insight and happy New Year once again. Andrew Pizer, global head of investment strategy at Russell Investments. I don't know whether there's a cutoff where you have to stop saying Happy New Year, but I feel like with the two years that we've had, I'm going to go on until February 2022. Now, U.S. index futures, indices futures, but also European stocks are rising, extending a pretty strong start to 2022. Coming up, OPEC and its allies are poised to revive more oil production when they meet today. So we talk about that. We talk about gas prices, of course, what it means to to inflation expectations and again investors are setting aside a lot of their worries about this highly infectious Omicron virus variant for the moment as they continue to trade on the economic recovery from the pandemic. This is Bloomberg. Well, the U.S. hits a record 1 million virus cases in a single day, the most any country has reported since the pandemic began. Balancing Act, OPEC Plus meets today with the group set for another boost to output. And convicted Elizabeth Holmes is found guilty of defrauding Theranos investors. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Happy 2022. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. We're getting a little bit of data out of the UK. I think that's just breaking as we speak. It will give us a good indication of what sterling will do. Now, it is a little bit backward looking in terms of the kind of data that we will see. And then we have a lot more data later on this afternoon from the US. We get on to PMEIs in Europe. So what we're getting is consumer credit, net consumer and net lending on some of dwelling mortgage approvals. Also, always a good thing to get us started for the new year in the UK because of the housing market, especially in London, being pretty hot over the last couple of quarters. So it's just coming out as we speak. I'm just waiting for it to be updated on the Bloomberg terminal. There it is, manufacturing PMI 57 Point nine instead of the uh, preliminary 57.6, so a tick up for December manufacturing. Let's also talk oil. OPEC and its allies are poised to revive more oil production when they meet today. Delegates say the 23-nation alliance is on track to ratify another modest output revival of 400,000 barrels a day. Now, the meeting follows news that Libyan output is set to drop by 200,000 barrels a day as workers try to fix a damaged pipeline. Well, joining us now to discuss all things oil, our executive editor for commodities, he's Will Kennedy. Will, good morning. Happy January. What are we expecting actually from OPEC Plus? Happy New Year, Francine. Um, we are expecting them to go ahead with a plan of raising production by another 400,000 barrels a day, something they've been doing uh, regularly over the last uh, six months or so, gently feeding more supply into the market to, to feed the recovery we're seeing in global energy demand. So, Will, Libya and Iran are two risks for oil traders at the moment. What's the latest? Uh, sorry, Francine, I didn't quite catch that question. So if you look at the individual countries, what's the latest, for example, with Libya? What are we expecting? Well, Libya, of course, uh, we've seen uh, production fall markedly, and that's another reason why uh, OPEC will feel fairly confident in raising production targets. They are forecasting a surplus in global oil supply in the first quarter, um, but ministers seem inclined to look beyond that for a number of reasons, uh, Libya among them. But also, I think later in the year, we see that surplus um, ending and a, and, a, and a renewed deficit in the global oil market. Um, ministers in their technical reports yesterday don't see a huge hit to demand from the Omicron virus. Uh, problems in Libya, as you suggest, no new Iranian oil coming. And of course, many OPEC countries aren't quite able to meet their um, production quotas, at least in the short term. So the production may not be quite as big as planned. So for all those reasons, ministers seem fairly confident in, in their decision. Um, you know, we shouldn't rule out a surprise, but most people expect them to go ahead with the increase.
Well, thank you so much, Will Kennedy there, our executive editor for Commodities. Now, a group of New York City teachers have asked a judge to force remote classes for two weeks amid the surge in COVID-19 cases. But Mayor Eric Adams says schools must remain open. Well, he spoke to Bloomberg's David Weston. What has happened in the past, you had one diagnosis, we want, to, we want to close the entire school. That just makes no sense. Instead of using our resources in a strategic fashion, the science has shown just because one child has COVID in the classroom, it doesn't mean the entire school or the classroom is infected. We're going to be smarter and we're going to pivot. And most importantly, we're going to defeat COVID. Mayor Adams, give us a sense about the, what the strategy here is, because I can envision two different strategies. One is, let's try to slow down or stop the spread of this disease. Another is, we have to manage through it. As a practical matter, as do we as New Yorkers have to get used to the idea we all may get this? <laughs> you know, you, I could not have said it better. Uh, so here's a strategy that the way I look at it and the way my team, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and others and educators, Take my hat off to the UFT president, Michael Mulgrew, and all of these great educators. Uh, these are real heroes on the front line. But we need to realize we can't live our lives through COVID. Every variant comes out. We can't spend another $11 trillion. We spent $11 trillion on COVID. We have to figure out how do we live with COVID. Let's be smarter, social distancing washing our hands, wearing our masks. When it's needed to do mandates for certain reasons, let's adjust and do so, and then we'll come back around. But this is the new reality that we must face. Our city and school system must open. We must continue to focus. We can't use lose two more years of education for our children. It's hurting them socially, academically, and it also impacts on families. And I'm, I am straight ahead that this city is going to function, we're going to be safe, and we're going to stay open. Uh, Mayor Adams, you mentioned where you need to have mandates, you have to go that direction. Tell us about mandates for boosters for city employees. I've heard you say mm, you're thinking about it, you're not quite there yet. Do you have a sense of when you'll have a decision on that? We're looking around April. We're going to do an analysis of you know, how COVID is moving. Uh, it's a moving target. It's a formidable opponent. Uh, but COVID doesn't realize that New York is a formidable opponent. We are resilient. We're going to do an analysis around April based on the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and see if we're going to mandate them. But that does not take away from my clear message to New Yorkers. Get your booster shots. Get vaccinated. Do an analysis of the chart. People think, well, okay, I, I have my vaccine, I won't get COVID. Listen, you may get COVID with the vaccine, but one thing for sure, you're less likely to die and be hospitalized if you are vaccinated and you have a booster shot, particularly for those with comorbidities and pre-existing uh, conditions. And so the vaccine saved your family, it saves you, and it allows our city to open and on a faster pace. And so we're going to look at if we have to mandate it. If we do, we will do it. But right now, we're not there yet. Well, that was New York City Mayor Eric Adams speaking to our David Westing. Now, predicting where Bitcoin will go is also always a tricky business, but some analysts are sticking their necks out with their 2022 outlooks. Well, Anthony Trenchev, managing partner of crypto lender Nexo, for instance, not the most neutral, but he's forecasting a $100,000 handle by June. Others more skeptical. Well, a key driver for crypto this year is likely to be central bank policies. Our Bloomberg Markets Life Deputy Managing Editor Eddie van der Valt joins us now with the very latest. Eddie, Bitcoin's 2021, a year of ups and downs, uh, to put it mildly. Who do you think won it, the bulls or the bears? <laughs> you know, uh, that's a, such a good question. I, I think it, it was a wild year last year, but there were some real breakthroughs for the cryptocurrency space, right? I think we saw cryptocurrencies really become part of the financial furniture, as it were. A year or two ago, people were still arguing that, look, cryptocurrencies are going to go to zero. These things are, are inherently worthless. I don't think there's anybody out there saying that anymore because we've now got ETFs. We've had uh, I IPOs in this space, and we have futures contracts that are that are that are fairly liquid. So I think there's 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 now a financial infrastructure that's there that's made it open to institutional investors, and they've taken on Bitcoin. And I think for those reasons, you know, I think that last year was a real breakthrough and sets up a very interesting future for the cryptocurrencies. Because what it's become much more mainstream, Eddie. And what does the future look like after you know the year that was, where it seemed to have changed the narrative on not only Bitcoin, just cryptocurrencies? 
Yeah, you know, I think I think this the, I, the way I like to think of it is we've we've had this breakthrough. Bitcoin got through its its sort of difficult, you know, uh, initial years, but we're now entering the sort of teenage years for Bitcoin. We 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 will really with de- with the cryptocurrency space will really define what they are, what they mean, and what we will do with them. And I think some of them, like Ethereum and Cardano and so on, have taken on the NFT space and have moved the narrative a little bit forward in, in terms of what we're going to do with cryptocurrencies. And I think that's what we're, we're moving towards. We're moving towards a period of uh, defi- de- def- or a defining period for, for, for the cryptocurrencies. Um, it seems regulators waking up to the crypto space, particularly in the U.S., how much does that actually matter going forward? Yeah, the, you know, I, the regulation is a, is a big risk factor for the cryptocurrencies, right? Because there, there really hasn't been any. So there's been sort of a regulatory arbitrage between the cryptocurrency space and regular assets. And that will be closed off by regulators. And that could be negative for the cryptocurrencies in the short term. In the longer term, though, Having regulation wrapped around the asset class means that more people can get engaged, whether institutional investors, whether hedge funds or, uh, or, or, or pension funds or private investors, right? If you don't have regulation, you can't have ETFs. Now, we've already seen some of that gap closed, but I think more of that will happen. And I think short term, negative, long term, very positive for the cryptocurrency space. Thank you so much, our Eddie van der Valt there, our Bloomberg Markets Live Deputy Managing Editor, joining us on Cryptocurrency. Now, coming up, convicted Elizabeth Holmes faces up to 20 years in prison for defrauding Theranos investors. We have all of the details next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So let's check on the markets. Also, a reminder that the operating system we understand that has made a BlackBerry function for such a long time is no longer operational from the end of today. So rest in peace, BlackBerry. I know a number of you have actually tweeted me and saying it was one of the best phones they've ever had, especially the BlackBerry Bolt. So also, as we start a fresh year, looking back and reminiscing at some of the things that have helped us do our job a little bit better. Now, U.S index futures and also European stocks are rising, extending a strong start to 2022. Investors currently betting that data on U.S. manufacturing and job openings will further show that the world's largest economy, of course, the U.S., is resilient against the spread of Omicron. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bridgewater Associates has named two co-CEOs to replace David McCormick as he steps down to explore a potential Senate run. New Bardia and Mark Bertoloni will become the joint heads of the world's biggest hedge fund. Bardia has become deputy CEO since February. Now, Credit Suisse says it is laying off 69 employees in New York. According to a company filing, the jobs cuts will take place in March, with the lenders set to wind down its prime services division by August. The move comes in the wake of the Archegos collapse, which cost Credit Suisse a $5.5 billion in losses. Now, AT&T and Verizon say they have agreed to a two-week delay of a 5G deployment that was sought by U.S. authorities. The carriers had vowed a day earlier to go ahead with launching their new services this week. That was in defiance of requests from officials who fear the 5G signals might interfere with aircraft electronics posing a safety risk and as Francine did mention earlier it is the end of the road for an iconic smartphone the Washington Post reports that today is the end of the life date for the BlackBerry it says the company is warning devices running on BlackBerry's legacy operating systems will no longer reliably function and won't be able to send a text message or dial emergency services the phone's popularity in the early noughties earned them the nickname Crackberries. I think we're all addicted. And that's your Bloomberg <laughs> business flash, Francine. Well, Leanne, I remember, I remember those days so well. And I remember when heads of state would then be inaugurated and, and you know, secret services would actually ply their BlackBerry away from them because they were addicted. And then, of course, Tom also reminded me of, you know, the small Nokia phones that you could drop in a pint and they'd still survive. And 
you know, the battery life was like seven days. I was just saying that earlier, Francine, I remember the really old Nokia's. You could throw it off a five-story building, it would charge for three days long. They were so robust. But today, all my memories flooded back from the first time I managed to get an email when I was on the run. I mean, it feels like it was so long ago, but how life has changed. I mean, life has changed. I used to have a pager. Wait, on the run? <laughs> Leanne, this is a conversation for the next hour. Yes. I want to hear more about Leanne on the run with a Nokia phone. <laughs> now, let's turn to one of Silicon Valley's most dramatic falls from grace. The founder of blood testing startup Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, has been found guilty of criminal fraud over the collapse of the $9 billion company. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Simone Foxman. Simone, what's the background on this? I mean, it's a pretty extraordinary story. I know everyone was on tenterhooks, you know, throughout the trial. And what exactly did the jury decide? Well, the jury said that Holmes uh, committed or was was guilty of four of the 11 counts that she was faced with, mainly relate, relating to uh, conspiracy to defraud investors and wire fraud uh, in terms of investor uh, investor relations. Um, but this was really a black mark for Silicon Valley. And one of the first major stories um, to erode the trust between investors and startups and journalists and startups, frankly, because Holmes was out there channeling Steve Jobs selling this life-changing uh, potentially company she even brought on board managed to convince the likes of former US Secretary of State George Soltz Henry Kissinger to be on her board and a lot of investors really took her at her word when in reality the accuracy data and the revenue data and the like that she was presenting wasn't accurate wasn't there um, so certainly I think there's an inflection point for Silicon Valley here to reflect on how this went uh, and we've seen a journal Journalists be a bit more critical uh, of startups uh, in the past couple of years. I was going to ask Simone, does this impact actually the startup world? And, you know, investors with hindsight probably should have known better. What comes next for Elizabeth Holmes? Yeah, they should have. And I mean, certainly the folks who did invest lost $600 million. Um, but we have yet to see a sentencing. So the counts that she was convicted of uh, bring, sentence, bring sentencing of about 20 years maximum. Uh, but most experts don't think she'll get that full number. She also may decide to appeal. And there's a separate uh, civil court case going on. Uh, she may be forced uh, to pay more money uh, around this case. We're also watching the case of Sonny Balwani. He was the president of Theranos, and Holmes has blamed him uh, for a lot of the failures and the collapse of the company that went on. His case starts in February, and most of those legal analysts say, look at this trial of Holmes. Uh, he is unlikely to be acquitted on most of those charges because they're the same charges that she was just pressed on in front of the jury. So she, she was found guilty of some counts, but not others. Can you explain that a little, with a little bit more detail, Simone? Yeah, most of the counts she was found guilty on were uh, misleading investors or, or, or conducting a behavior that would mislead investors. Um, but they, she wasn't found guilty on some of the counts related to misleading patients. So if you got a false positive HIV test, uh, she wasn't found guilty on those counts. A jury not seeing the harm uh, that those things specifically uh, entailed because you could go and get other tests. Um, there were three counts, however, that she that the jury couldn't uh, reach a conclusion on. It's unclear whether the U.S. attorney uh, that was responsible for the case will actually go try and retry those. A lot of those counts also have to do with investor matters rather than patient matters as well. Simone, thank you so much. Simone Foxman there on the very latest, of course, of Elizabeth Holmes. Now, coming up, Shiny Apple, the tech giant's valuation topped $3 trillion. So we'll discuss what's ahead in terms of sets being sold, but also regulation and how that could hurt shares going forward. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Apple's market value briefly rose above $3 trillion before pairing gains to close at another record. The stock has more than tripled since COVID sent the world into lockdown in early 2020. Now, Apple is now trading at a premium to its average historical multiple and is 5% above the average analyst price target. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg Quick Takes Alex Webb. Alex, if you look at Apple, it's a pretty incredible feature to touch that three trillion uh, dollar mark and then it kind of went down what's you know looking at it is it all about regulation or can they do even better well, it's actually kind of hard to see what actually, what Apple, in fact, themselves are doing to drive this. You know, it's been a reliable generator of returns, both on the um, stock side, but also they are doing uh, buybacks now. And and frankly, that hasn't changed. That narrative hasn't changed much over the past year or so. People continue to buy iPhones. It's more to do with where people are looking to put their money. And frankly, they see Apple perhaps as a safe haven, as a safer bet than other parts of, of the uh, of the market. And so it's as much to do with those considerations as it is anything Apple is doing. But, uh, so, Alex, what kind of regulation could we see on Apple and some of their peers actually going into 2022? Would it come from the U.S. first? Um, actually, Apple probably is going to be in a slightly safer position than some of the other companies. The parts, the regulatory questions surrounding Apple mostly focus on the App Store, which is a very small part of its business. It is not a small business. It is in the tens of billions of, of dollars in revenue, but as an overall part of Apple's business, relatively small. If you compare that to Facebook or Google or indeed Amazon, the things that are being considered there are more core to the way they actually make money. It does look as though there is, there is regulation in the works in the US. There is also regulation in the works in Europe. How that gets wielded, it's more likely to come out of the US first than it is in Europe, even if the ability of Europe to regulate the stock is going to be a lot keener than what is happening in the US. What's your take on Tesla? We saw Elon Musk's you know, private fortune go up by 30 billion. It's pretty impressive because they delivered cars and actually did better than a lot of analysts were expecting. What are the pitfalls going ahead? There was a, a beautiful analyst note saying, look, they, you know, congratulations to Elon Musk, but actually the road to 2022 will be even harder. Look, it's no secret that, that Tesla is not trading at multiples that by any normal analysis make much sense. You know, it is trading at something, you know, hundreds of multiples of its, uh, of its future earnings and, and that is hard to make, to justify. This is really a momentum stock in a way that, you know, it's not in a sense massively dissimilar from Bitcoin. It is an, a bet clearly on the future of, of driving, the idea that, that you're not going to be having, a, you know, combustion engines in 5, 8, 10, 15, 20 years. But equally, all the other car companies are coming into this space as well. Is their tech as good as Tesla? Maybe not. Will their cars be cheaper than Tesla? Probably. So there's, you know, it isn't quite the logical play that, that we might like it to be. It is nonetheless clearly good news for Elon's um, coffers. Alex, you know what really set Twitter alight is the fact that BlackBerry devices and also the, the Bloomberg terminal with so many IB chats, you know, the BlackBerry device is still running their operating system will stop functioning for the end of from the end of January 4th today. I mean, that's like the end of an era. It is certainly the end of like the first experience <laughs> of smartphones. This was a smartphone, really, even if it was a very basic one. Yeah. Alex, thank you so much. Alex Webb there. We'll have plenty more market analysis. This is Bloomberg. The biggest risk remains not being in equities rather than being out of equities. This is the new reality that we must face. Our city and school system must open. Despite of this massive uh, case explosion with Omicron, uh, the United States, Europe, the developed world is going to feel much more normal, finally, uh, within weeks. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, January 4th. Our top stories today. Convicted, Elizabeth Holmes is found guilty of, uh, for her role around Theranos after seven days of deliberations. 
Fed appointments, the White House is set to nominate economist Philip Jefferson for a seat on the Board of Governors. And balancing act, OPEC Plus meets today with the group expected to boost output again. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Danny Berger in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Kayleigh Lines is off today. And Matt, we see a lot of New Year optimism. Day two for many European markets. Day one here in London, of course. And we started the day with some really high infection numbers on Omicron coming out of the United States. But that, crucially, does not seem to be denting uh, sentiment. Doesn't bother anybody, right? More than a million infections in one day, a new global record, and yet I will be flying into the uh, eye of the storm on Friday. Take a look at what's going on in Asia. You've got gains there with the MSCI Asia Pacific up almost 1%. Um, the ASX 200 up 2%, and this is a three standard deviation move away from the 30-day average. So Australia really kicking it. The Nikkei up 1.8% and the yen, this is a five-year low for the yen. Even though um, the color is green, the arrow is up, that means you can now buy almost 116 yen for the dollar. And that means that people are just less concerned, right? The yen is a safe haven currency. And if people sell out of it for the dollar or other currencies, that means they're not worried as they were the day before. Let's take a look at what's going on also in the U.S. this morning as we prepare for the trade. You've got S&P futures up a quarter percent right now. So even after another day of gains, uh, more to come, it looks like, 47.97 there. The 10-year yield coming down, although look at that, a 160 handle, 163 almost. So we rose up uh, pretty well yesterday in yesterday's session, and now investors are, uh, are buying some of that back, pushing the yield down, but just really a little bit, so you could call it unchanged. The Bloomberg U.S. dollar index is rising, although very little change there, as you'll see when you take a look at the euro and the pound. Not a lot of movement across currencies. NYMEX crude, though, is up 76.45 a barrel for West Texas Intermediate Oil. So, again, the market is optimistic about the demand picture going forward. Danny, what do you see in Europe? You could really say much of the same for Europe, and I guess it was getting jealous of the new high set in the U.S. because finally we are getting there in Europe. The stock 600 currently trading at all-time highs for the first time this year. It didn't do so yesterday. That might be because we have the inclusion of FTSE 100 stocks today. That's trading up more than 1%. Gains of around 1% for the CAC. DAX up about three-tenths of 1%. FTSE MIB up about three-tenths of 1%. So really the strongest gains are being had by, this, by the equities that are playing catch up. So let me de dive deeper into UK stocks again, because this is really what's moving today to not just play catch up with yesterday, but also add on to some of the market optimism. I mentioned the FTSE 100, but really what's doing the best in the UK are those mid cap stocks. This is the FTSE 250. That is up more than one and a half percent. These are going to be your more cyclical stocks. The one, for example, that benefit from a stronger pound, which we do see today, and maybe a more risk on type attitude and looking through Omicron as Matt you're saying much of these markets are. We're also looking at a 10-year yield in the UK, gilt yields that are having to play catch up with that strong selling that took place yesterday in the UK and much of Europe. So those yields up about eight, per, uh, eight basis points at their highest since November. That's the pre-Omicron level. And finally, I also want to point out that airlines listed in London doing extremely well today. IAG, that's the British Airways parent company, and Wizz Air, which is a more domestic uh, budget airline, both of them up more than 10 percent. The two best performers on the stock 600. Uh, we not only had a positive note out from City yesterday talking about big airlines doing well with travel to China, but at the same time, Boris Johnson, according to the BBC, looking at keeping restrictions as is. So that's fueling a lot of optimism for these airlines, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. We continue to watch the commodity space. And I know you wanted to flag UK natural gas mm. prices as well, Danny, jumping by 31% in just today's session. But believe it or not, that's still only around half the price level yes. that we saw uh, in the month of December. So such a lot of volatility there. Let's linger on the energy theme and tell you what is coming up ahead today. Because OPEC and its allies meet to decide on output. The group is likely to revive more halted oil production after giving a tighter outlook for global markets. The US then reports auto sales. Car makers face 
plenty of challenges in getting their industry back to pre-pandemic levels, back to talking about chips, I guess. And with that in mind, the world's biggest consumer electronics event, they're all competing for these chips these days, aren't they? Cars and, uh, and uh, the electronics industry. The CES Technology Conference, that is back live and in person, at least for some, at least for those who managed to get there. Many people have pulled out, of course. Uh, it is taking place, though, at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Back to one of our top stories then today. Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes has been found guilty of criminal fraud over the collapse of her $9 billion blood testing company. The U.S. federal jury convicted Holmes on four counts uh, of the 11 that she'd been charged with. The 37-year-old now faces up to 20 years in prison. Tina Davis, uh, Bloomberg Legal Executive Editor, uh, joins us now Tina good to speak to you uh, what was what was what was surprising I suppose about this what struck you as interesting when you when you reflect on everything we've uh, we've learned about the way this case uh, unfolded well there's nothing there's no, no shortage of interesting things happening in this trial this was a three-month trial and as you mentioned at the top this was a jury that went seven full days for deliberations and they found her guilty on four charges, not guilty on four charges, and they were unable to reach a verdict on three of the charges. So in the actual California courtroom, there was no visible reaction from Holmes as the verdict was read. She had her parents behind her in the front row and her partner, and they also sat silently while the verdict was handed down. She faces, as you mentioned, a 20-year potential maximum sentence in prison. She'll likely serve far less than that. Um, but each of the charges carries a 20-year maximum sentence. They will likely be held, uh, be served concurrently rather than, uh, or simultaneously rather than concurrently. Jurors in the case heard from mm -hmm. dozens of witnesses who said that Holmes didn't just exaggerate claims about her comp company's technology, but actually lied to investors. And she herself took to the stand for several days of testimony, which was a surprise, since in most of these cases we don't hear from the defendant herself. And she admitted right. to some mistakes in that testimony. But defense said she was a victim of abuse by her partner and by the who was also the president of the company, Sonny Balwani, who's facing his own trial later. Um, right. You know, this was a this was a dramatic descent for her. You know, this is a Silicon Valley where fake it till you make it attitude is often rewarded. Uh, but this is probably unlikely to have a significant effect on how Silicon Valley works in the future. One of my colleagues talked to several investors who said, you know, in a red hot startup market. No one's willing to slow down for due diligence, and this may not be a chastening right. event for anybody in that market. All right, Tina, fantastic roundup. Thanks so much. That's Bloomberg's Tina Davis there. Now, Bloomberg's also been told the White House is likely to nominate Philip Jefferson for a seat on the Fed Board of Governors. He would be just the fourth black man to hold the position in the central bank's more than 100-year history. Anne-Marie Horder, and Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now from D.C. Anne-Marie, what do we know about Jefferson and how his pick would reshape the Fed Board of Governors? Well, his nomination would, Danny, as you say, bring much-needed diversity in terms of the criticism that the Fed has been facing. He would be just the fourth black man to join the gover governorship of the Fed since its inception. So this would be a very much a big idea, uh, a big change for the Fed. And also, it would be delivering on a promise from the president. Back in November, when the president reappointed Fed Chair Jay Powell and elevated Governor Brainard, he said that his next nomination would, quote, bring new diversity to the Fed, which is much needed and long overdue, in my opinion. So this would be something that the president had promised to do. And it would only be the first, though, we should note. This is the first we have on the reporting of those potential three seats for that board that the president still needs to fill. He has another governorship he has, as well as the vice chair of supervision, which is really critical as well for the progressives of his party. So uh, yesterday... Emory Jack Fitzpatrick said we could get a Joe Manchin update. Did we get anything yesterday? Do we know anything <laughs> more about Build Back Better? Well, we should note that yesterday was really a slow day in Washington. I mean that also physically, the roads, it was very hard to get around. You couldn't even order cars, so lots of walking. So the Capitol uh, was very sleepy. But what we did learn from Axios reporting is that it does seem like the senator wants to come back to the table and negotiate, especially when it comes to climate provisions and some child um, uh, family health, uh, family provisions. But potentially this would mean that the White House would have to ditch those child tax credits or at least lower the cap for those. So potentially this is where it's going to come down really in the negotiations, those child tax credits. And if they're not part of Build Back Better, potentially they go on to another bill. But it's going to be a big fight this year, especially since it's a midterm election year.
Okay, Amory, thank you very much. Amory Hordern on Mansion Watch for us in Washington. Now, OPEC yeah. and its allies are poised to revive more oil production when they meet today after giving a tighter outlook for global markets. Let's uh, talk now to Paul Wallace, who leads our energy and commodities coverage in the Middle East and North Africa. Today he's in London, though. Paul, very nice to have you here with us. So what are we expecting from OPEC? Uh, lots of voices I've heard from today say, yes, we are expecting 400,000 barrels a day uplift in production from, from OPEC. So if that's not not going to be a surprise. What are you watching for? Hi, Anna. Yes, it's very much the consensus that we'll see the group uh, agree to increase crude production by 400,000 barrels a day next month. Um, some things, there's some uh, details that traders will be looking at. One of them, for example, is whether the uh, whether OPEC Plus decides to keep the session, uh, or decides to keep the meeting in session. Um, that's what it did for the December meeting. It's a technical thing, but what it does do is it keeps markets on edge a bit because it allows OPEC plus to reconvene extremely quickly um, within a matter of hours possibly and change its decision. So that will be an interesting thing, thing to see uh, whether it repeats that. Um, and the other thing will be um, if they do a press conference just what uh, key players like the Saudi Arabians say um, uh, as, um, as to the outlook for oil demand over the next few months. Paul, there's also an expectation, and OPEC itself does see itself switching to a surplus this quarter. To what degree will that put pressure on prices? This is a big question, and most of the market, and as you said, even OPEC itself, expects the uh, expects a switch from a supply deficit to a surplus, and quite a big one. OPEC is predicting 1.4 million barrels per day of oversupply in the first quarter, uh, getting even bigger in the second quarter. Um, but the reason the cartel is not too worried about that is because it sees um, it sees inventories, global inventories, is very low at the moment. All the um, cutbacks in production that OPEC Plus did in the last 18 months have paid off as far as they're concerned, and they think that inventories are starting from a low base. So for the moment, they are pretty optimistic. Paul, thank you very much. That's Paul Wallace there, who leads our energy and commodities coverage in the Middle East and North Africa, of course, with us here in London today. Now, let's take a look at some of the stocks moving pre-market in the U.S., sticking with the energy theme, but clean energy, specifically clean energy fuels. This is a company in the U.S. that was upgraded by Raymond James. In fact, Raymond James upgrading many clean energy names, including for solar, solar power as well. ESG, really a dominant theme for the year of 2022, perhaps not that dissimilar from 2021. So that equity moving higher by 4.9%. Also looking into ETF land, we're front end VIX futures ETF moving lower today by 2%. There's always a really useful way to dissect the VIX because this is the front end of the curve. In other words, what will volatility look like in the near term? We've already seen the VIX itself fall below 17, but that is really being concentrated in what volatility will look like in the near term. So it's this risk on move really amplified by how different traders are betting on that picture of volatility. Finally, we continue to be on three trillion dollar market cap watch we almost got there for apple we just kissed it and backed away currently apple in the pre-market session up half a percent in order for it to be at three trillion dollars we need it to be at 182.8 Currently, the share price is 182.9. So, Anna, if it keeps up this level at open, Apple, once again, will be worth $3 trillion. OK, so it's not, it doesn't count unless it closes uh, yes. above that level then it, it, uh, for, for Danny Berger. Yeah, shares of Apple have more than tripled since the onset of the pandemic in 2020, if you're thinking about pandemic winners so far. Now, coming up on the programme, Kit Dukes, Societe Generale's chief FX strategist, will get his take on where the strong dollar trade goes this year. Also, what's going on with the yen this morning? And on the OPEC meeting, we'll talk to Oli Hens uh, Hansen, Saxo Bank Head of Commodity Strategy. That conversation ahead of the OPEC Plus meeting. We will also talk about Apple briefly topping the $3 trillion in value. But how much further does it have to go? More on that shortly. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller with Danny Berger and Anna Edwards in London. I'm in Berlin. They're in London. Either way, no matter where you are, it is <laughs> dreary outside. Don't look out your window mm -hmm. because it's really depressing. <laughs> 
Uh, I've got here a chart. For those of you on Bloomberg Television, you'll see a little bit of spaghetti here that I'm going to walk you through. If you're on Bloomberg Radio, just email me at mtmiller at bloomberg.net. I'll send you this chart. Um, what we're looking at here is the performance of four major global indexes over the past 12 months. So how did we do in 2021? Well, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index didn't do well. In fact, it dropped, it lost money in 2021. The Tokyo Stock Price Index actually rose, but only 10 or 11 percent. Europe did relatively well, up 22 and a half percent over 2021, almost as well as the S&P 500, which closed up 27 percent. So Europe isn't a huge laggard. In fact, I think the headline to take from this isn't that the U.S. wins. Obviously, we all know that, but that Europe is beating out Asia and emerging markets. Lynn Thomas and Bloomberg Managing Editor for EMEA Markets joins us now. Uh, Lynn, it, it was kind of dreary across the continent and in London all year in terms of stock performance. Every time we talk about it, we say there's such a huge gap to the U.S., but at the end of the day, it performed relatively well. Absolutely. I think that's such an interesting story and, you know, one that hasn't gotten enough attention really. Um, you know, I think everyone, the, the story about Europe has always been that it's underperforming the U.S., that it's not as, as interesting and, and attractive as, you know, the hot names like Apple and, and Tesla. But, you know, relatively speaking, Europe had a great year. And I think if you look at the action today, it's continuing to do well. You're seeing um, travel stocks um, with really quite strong rallies, considering the Omicron headlines that are in the news. Um, but I think investors are just continuing to say, you know, we're able to look through the virus news and and um, and buy some of these cheap assets. Mm. Uh, Lynn, good morning. Yes, I want to pick up on that point about Omicron and the way we seem to be able to look through the negative headlines, certainly on infections. It'll be different if it's about hospitalizations, uh, but we reserve judgments on that one, perhaps. But on infections, the U.S. setting a new global daily record for cases of more than one million people diagnosed in one day. That's just for one country. It's not so long ago. That would have been for many countries or for the globe. Uh, markets, though, really are managing to look through this in the first couple of trading days of the year. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we're back into that kind of strange position where lots of people, myself included, are working from home. You know, I was listening to the news today and there was concern, you know, are schools going to close? Children are, you know, back to being asked to wear masks. But, you know, I think the economy and, um, you know, investors as a consequence of being able to say, look, you know, we're going to get through this. The hospitalization rate is really what people are paying attention to. And the message so far has been that it's milder. And, um, I think, you know, that's reading into the big gains that you're seeing in, in travel stocks today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, travel, uh, certainly a winner. Some of those travel names, as Danny was pointing out, up by nearly 10% uh, or around that mark this morning here in London. Thanks to Bloomberg's Lynn Thomason. Thank you for joining us. You can get uh, up-to-date market analysis. MLIV Go is the function to use to keep across the Markets Live blog. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger with Anna Edwards in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lines is off. Now let's get to the first word news. And the UAE is said to be at risk of being placed on a list of countries subject to more oversight. That's for shortcomings in combating money laundering and terrorist financing. Bloomberg has learned the Financial Action Task Force is leaning towards adding the country to its gray list early this year. If approved, it would be among the most significant steps in the global watchdog's history, given the UAE's position as the main financial financial hub of the Middle East. Hong Kong is to require people to have at least one COVID-19 vaccine to enter restaurants and public leisure facilities from late February. The government is pushing back its plans until after the Lunar New Year holidays to allow businesses to prepare and to give the city time to roll out vaccines to the one million or so people still without a first dose. And it's the end of the road for an iconic smartphone. The Washington Post reports that today is the end of life date for the BlackBerry. It says the company is warning devices running on BlackBerry's legacy operating systems will no longer reliably function and won't be able to send a text message or dial emergency services. The phone's popularity in the early noughties earned them the nickname Crackberries. I mean, Matt, I don't know about Crackberries, forget 
BlackBerry. I am still mourning the loss of my Nokia flip phone. Um, <laughs> and I'm not ashamed to say that it was indeed bedazzled. I think, what, really? Wow. Yes. But I guess you were that age at the time. I, I have to say, <laughs> I still miss the BlackBerry and the keyboard. Um, nothing will yes. ever replace that in terms of typing on a screen. I thought it was amazing. Mm. I wish they would make a comeback. I know, and I have to say, maybe it's just because we work in TV, you're used to doing outside broadcasts, being far too cold to be outside, and your hands freezing up. Touch screens just really don't work that well in that climate. Anyway, some work no. in pro progress for the tech industry, <laughs> if they'd like the challenge. Right, coming up on the program, Kit Jukes, Societe Generale's macro strategist. We'll talk to him about yields. We saw a real jump in U.S. yields, to some extent across the curve. That was part of yesterday's story. Today, a little more mixed. But that higher yield environment, if we're heading there, what does that do to FX markets? We'll get that view from Kit shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lines is off today. Danny Berger here with me in London as well. Uh, Matt, really interesting. When I was looking at the markets this morning, a few hours ago, early London time, I was looking at the higher yield story uh, that, that really dominated the thinking yesterday. And I was thinking to myself, is that because everyone's feeling animal spirits, much more risk on? Or is it because they're just pricing in higher inflation expectations? Uh, and, and it seemed as if it was the latter. But then this morning, you look at what we're seeing on European equity markets, and it does look pretty risk on. I mean, we have some aviation stocks up by more than 10% this morning. Yeah, and I would also point out that if they were pricing in higher inflation expectations, I mean, it's January 4th, why weren't they pricing in higher inflation <laughs> expectations a week ago or a month ago or three months ago? I mean, um, this is not a surprise. It's not like something has magically changed uh, because it's 2022. So, I still have that question. In fact, I'm going to pose it to an expert a little bit later. Why are we seeing Why yields rise now? Why don't we do that? Yeah, I was cautioned earlier on that perhaps there was a little lower volume yesterday, that that might have been part of the story, but there were some trades technicals. going through, Danny, always where technicals. some investors always technicals, <laughs> where some investors were thinking about mid-February 10-year yields at 1.95%, which looks pretty punchy from where we stand yeah. right now. But how high yields go? Big question for the markets in 2022. It certainly is, and maybe to kind of bolster Matt's argument that it's all about technicals, we did see positioning among leverage funds at one of their most net shorts in multiple years. So, hey, maybe it is all technicals, but at least for these markets today, we are unchanged on the 10-year yield. But still, it is at this high level that saw its biggest move higher in yields since 2009 yesterday. So perhaps not that crazy to see it take a break today. Today, But what's not taking a break is this March higher in U.S. equities in the pre-market session. That's moving higher by nearly four-tenths of one percent. Uh, we're also looking at a yen that is falling today kind of adding to this risk off type attitude at its lowest since 2017. And finally, Brent just below $80 a barrel were, of course, on OPEC watch, expecting them to hike their level of barrel outputs by about 400,000. Now, when it comes to the pre-market session, we're seeing a lot of these clean energy stock names do well, specifically uh, clean energy fuels is one of them. Raymond James just upgraded them, upgraded a few clean energy names, I should say, including uh, for solar as well. Seeing that is a theme going forward, that ESG theme, it's not going anywhere. We're also looking at VIX ETFs moving lower, again, feeding into this theme that people are happy to take on risk, and the consequences of that will be falling volatility, especially in the front end of the curve, which this is tracking. And Matt, as always, we are on $3 trillion watch for Apple at $183.25 a share in the pre-market session. This puts it comfortably at the $3 trillion mark. Of course, we need to see it close there. Yesterday, it did not. So all it needs to do is hold the gains it's currently at to get there. All right. Very interesting. For no particular reason other than that, it's a <laughs> nice round number. Take a look at um, what I'm focused on here. And for those of you joining us on Bloomberg Radio, I will tell you it's a couple things we were just talking about. One, the U.S. 10-year yield. Two, the Japanese yen price in dollars or the dollar price in Japanese yen, actually. Um, what I'm looking at here is a 10-year yield that has risen back up to a 160 handle 
The question that we're all asking ourselves is why, um, and Kit Jukes is here to help us answer that. He's chief FX strategist at SockGen. I'm also looking at the yen. As you heard Danny say, Kit, uh, we're at the highest level that we've been since 2017. You can buy almost 116 yen for your dollar. Is this just all about investors who are uh, no longer as concerned about the 2022 risks um, as concerned as they were, say, two days ago? I don't think I hear Kit. I don't think I do I either. Like I wonder if we have one of those 2021, 2022 style problems yeah. where someone's on mute. Shall we give well, Kit a moment to... Well, telecoms has been difficult for a century now, but <laughs> I think he might have just muted himself. Kit, can we, can we go ahead and can you test that mic? No? No? All right. Well, I think he has the answer. And this is the interesting thing. It's leaving us all <laughs> just wondering what he was going to say. Why are yields climbing up again? <laughs> Why is the yen worth so little? Um, he's going to tell us as soon as we get the audio sorted out. In the meantime, should we talk about the weather? I mentioned it's dreary, right? Did you know today's my <laughs> yeah, last day in Berlin? Is it, is, it, is it still dreary uh, for your last day in Berlin, Matt? Is it still It's still dreary? quite rainy. Do you know what? Yeah, I, I think still... we might have Kit on the line now. You go again, Matt. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness. All right, Kit, I think we've got you back on the line. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Why is the market so risk on today? Can you hear me this time? Yes. Yes. Good. I'm very, very grateful to receive it. Playing with my glasses to sort these out. Look, I think the market's risk on on because it's utterly focused on the idea that we've come into the start of this year, the Fed is going to start raising rates, the world's not going to end, um, the Omicron concerns of the market is by and large, you know, resolving that, you know, we're going to live with it, it it's going to have less of an economic impact, even if it goes on being a major issue in every other way imaginable. Um, but we've just come out of the, you know, a, a monstrously strong year for economic growth with an enormous amount of momentum. And Policy normalization is less scary to people as they look forwards to this year. So they're focused on rate rises that aren't yet scaring, particularly the bits of the equity market that are doing best. So um, mm. you mentioned a large manufacturer of all sorts of bits of equipment I have here. That They're not that sensitive <laughs> to what's happening to rates. Right. Yes, that's interesting because we seem to have been taking a glass half full picture of the rate story uh, kit as far as stocks are, are concerned because we saw banks rising yesterday. We see banks rising here in Europe today on the back of the higher rates environment and gilt yields going higher as well to keep treasuries company. Uh, but we don't see tech stocks necessarily falling, uh, falling over as a result. Is, is that something we, we c will continue to see, certainly with those big tech names then, Kit? Um, heaven knows in terms of where equity markets go, really. That's the one thing I've never understood. But, but, I think that, but I think they're still trading off the economic story, which is a belief that, you know, as we get through this, that, yes, we're going to have some inflation, but it's not necessarily going to turn into the kind of vicious cycle we saw in the 70s, that the Fed's going to normalize monetary policy. But, hey, rates in real terms yeah. are extraordinarily low and, and that we're not taking away the punch bowl, that all we're doing this year is getting life back to normal and that doesn't scare the equity market, while, you know, over in bond foreign exchange land, really what we're saying is the one thing that seems, if not nailed on, nailed on unless something goes badly wrong soon, is the Fed's going to be raising rates by the middle of the year. Uh, and we need to price that into the bond market with more confidence. We can price it into the foreign exchange market. Um, and, and we'll watch the equity market. Or from my seat, we watch the equity market say, if you get scared, we'll have to rethink. If the, if the virus okay. story gets really bad again, we'll have to rethink. But until then, this is what's driving it. OK, so, so uh, yeah, and apologies. Obviously, uh, away, a little away from your wheelhouse, but interesting to get your assessment of where stocks go, Kit, given the, you know, your perspective on, on global risk-taking. Um, if we are going to see rates markets pricing in Fed hikes with more confidence, use your words, Kit, how high does that take us on rates, and what does that then do to the dollar? Um, I, I think that you can, you know, we've priced in, we've got three rate hikes priced in for this year. I think the market could price more in for next year by the time it gets done. You, you can get a momentum to these things that, that overshoot. We, we typically always overshoot what eventually does happen. So I think you can get, you can take this further 
Um, but I think it'll all happen in the first half of the year. I think by the time the Fed actually raises rates, I suspect we'll have seen much of the sell-off in the uh, front end of the bond market and we'll have seen probably all of the dollars rally, in truth. This is a story for the next six months um, when, until until the, the actual hiking starts. And then I, I, then I think we'll, we, everyone turns around and takes stock and it gets much more difficult mm. to me. But right now... Um, as long as there's momentum, I wouldn't be surprised to see euro dollar trading under 110. I wouldn't even be surprised to see dollar yen trading at 120, though in real terms that makes the yen absurdly cheap. I just, apart from you know not being able to go there on, on holiday to take advantage of it, I don't know what to do with that. Right. But but um, mm. but this momentum, I think that you can get at the moment, can, can go can go for a while longer. And it comes off the back of just such a strong year for the dollar. It's best year since 2015, and. At the start of the year of 2020, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who felt that would be the case, just looking at the positioning, how short it was. Kit, I know this is something you look at. Where do we stand on positioning now when it comes to the greenback? So for, for, for want of a better description, against the major currencies, the market is already long dollars, but it is uh, only half as long dollars as it was on Thanksgiving. So Omicron took away quite a lot of the position in, in December, and I think that's what we're putting back on. Uh, this week pretty quickly. Um, and it's a lot, 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 lot less of a position, long dollars, than the short dollar was this time last year. When, as you rightly say, um, we should all have known better. Foolish us. Kit, thank you very much. A good place to lead the conversation. Kit Jukes, Chief FX Strategist at uh, Societe Generale, thank you for speaking to us and thank you for persisting with the technology as well. Always good to get an update from Kit early in the year. Coming up on the programme, we'll speak to Ole Hansen, Saxo Bank Head of Commodity Strategy. What is the expectation around the OPEC Plus meeting that takes place today? Seems to be a lot of consensus in the markets. Should we brace for surprise? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, WW International CEO Mindy Grossman. This is Bloomberg. Twenty twenty two. Twenty twenty two. Kicking off uh, twenty twenty two. Happy New Year. Twenty twenty one is now in our rearview mirror. Not really. The problem is going to be the story of 21. The same questions and concerns. Because we have inflation. The market's clearly worried about it. Will it come down fast enough to prevent the Fed from going for rate hikes? We have a very aggressive Fed this year. If the inflation super overheats, it's going to force the Fed's hand. Very, very critical for market outcomes next year. We've had uh, three years in a row of double digits for the S&P 500. We continue to see the market still being strong. Then I think we start to have a little bit more concern. And Make sure that you keep your fear contained. Have a flexible mind. Humility is very critical. Our earlier guests there talking about the markets as we bring in the new year, bring in 2022. And, and, and Danny, it's interesting. I mean, I started this morning then thinking that the markets were increasingly worried about inflation. That's why we saw higher yields. But then the longer this morning's gone on, the more guests I've been speaking to, the more it seems that we're uh, talking instead about a risk on environment yeah. uh, rather than being overly concerned uh, around inflation. Commodities certainly picking up on the risk on memo. We see oil prices heading higher today. Yeah, we see oil prices heading higher higher ahead of OPEC. We, of course, also see natural gas, Anna, in the UK up some 37% today. Yeah, absolutely. Let's pick up on the commodities theme. OPEC and its allies are po uh, poised sorry, to revive more oil production when they meet today. After giving a tighter outlook for global markets, joining us now is Ol Hansen, uh, Saxo Bank Head of Commodity Strategy. So, Ol, tell me something that we've not heard for the last few hours around this OPEC, uh, this OPEC Plus meeting, because a lot, of, a lot of voices saying, you know, we are going to get the 400,000, and that might be exactly as it is. It might play out that way. Other people telling me, be careful, because sometimes the Saudi Arabian uh, energy minister likes to surprise at these events. What is your expectation? Well, good morning, Anna. Well, I think when we look at uh, how they responded to the Omicron scare back in November, uh, where they basically went, uh, went ahead with their production increase, uh, I would be very surprised if they don't choose the same path uh, this time round. We've seen the, the impact on mobility uh, not being as, as severe as, as originally feared. And uh, even though we do see a, uh, they, they, they forecast, and the market generally forecast, a surplus here into the f early parts of the year, um, it seems like the, the market is, is, is willing to and able to absorb the, those additional barrels. 
I think also we have to uh, to remember it's coming at a time where we've seen production in in Libya drop to a one year low, probably almost a full monthly increase that they are not producing right now. Other countries are struggling to uh, to produce as well. So what this will mean is basically that uh, those who have spare capacity they will continue to increase market share, while others will uh, will be suffering. What do you see on the demand side, Ola, um, in terms of the reopening trade, people getting back on the road, people getting back in the air? I mean, we see airline stocks up like 10 percent and change here in Europe today. Is there going to be bigger demand in 2022? I think the demand will continue to uh, to, uh, to, uh, re uh, to, re to move on that path it has been now for in within the last 18 months on a recovery path and and uh, the question is really, I think basically more uh, not if but when we will exceed the uh, the peak we had uh, prior to the pandemic and uh, that also will require all hands on deck um, there are expectations that we will see non OPEC plus growth as well this year but uh, but generally uh, the uh, the market is is playing this from a from a, uh, a, a, a cautionary note and uh, with the risk that uh, we may see tightness as we move into the latter part of 22. And that's why we're seeing these prices pick up as nicely as they have. Also, I think uh, mm. even just before Christmas, we saw, uh, before New Year, we saw speculators actually re engage back into the oil market. We've seen weeks and weeks of selling uh, from hedge funds. They returned last week, they added 10%, and, uh, and the, the, the actual number they hold is still well below the peaks we saw last year. Well, that sounds like quite the constructive environment for prices. Ola, I was also talking to Mark and Martin Ratz of Morgan Stanley earlier today, who says that we could see oil at $90 a barrel this year. What are your expectations for prices? I think later in the year, the risk of that is most certainly uh, most certainly one we have to, to take into account. I think in the short term, uh, during the first quarter at least, uh, knowing that OPEC still have has plenty of spare capacity available, uh, we may just have to be a little bit uh, hesitant uh, by, by seeing that uh, or cautious about seeing a, a strong rally here at the beginning of the year. But uh, $90 as we move deeper into 22, and as the markets uh, continue to focus on, on where the next barrel is going to come from, uh, that will continue to underpin the prices. Also adding that the, the gas crisis we have here in Europe, Asia as well to a certain extent, will continue to, uh, to increase uh, or add uh, barrels uh, into, uh, fun, uh, due to the switch. And uh, that will also uh, keep some underlying demand in, mm. the, in the market that we didn't have a year ago. Ola, thank you very much for joining us. Ola Hansen, Saxo Bank Head of Commodity Strategy. Thanks for spending time with us here on Bloomberg TV. Coming up, Kumar Galhotra, Ford President of America's and International Markets Group. Really interesting to see what the consumption side of the energy story looks like then. To Matt's point, that's at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger alongside Anna Edwards in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lines is off. Now, Apple's market value briefly rose above the $3 trillion mark before pairing gains to close at another record yesterday. The stock has more than tripled since COVID sent the world into lockdown in early 2020. Of course, pre-market back at that $3 trillion level. Alex Webb, Bloomberg opinion, opinion columnist, joins us now. Alex, it is remarkable to look at the gains that Apple has enjoyed since November, given that the stock market was flat. Uh, our Bloomberg opinion columnist, Ty Kim, points out that nothing has really changed for Apple's prospects prospects in the meantime. So how do we explain this rally? Certainly, it seems to be seeking something which investors think is a short bet. You know, Apple does spend a huge amount on buybacks. It is, you know, looking at dividends and things as well. It does return a lot of money to investors. So as we over the past you know, few years, there has continued to be an investment in growth stocks uh, after a brief kind of cycle into into value before the pandemic, perhaps. This is now perhaps suggesting they're looking for value again. But equally, it doesn't even suggest that Apple is that great a bet when it comes to value. It is trading at pretty high multiples already. It's really about looking for, for returns uh, from you know, non-stock means, basically. What about the dividend um, or buybacks? What's the outlook for Apple giving money back to investors? Because they certainly have enough cash on the balance sheet. Yeah, and Apple has said that over time it wants to get to a 
a sort of a cash neutral position on a net basis. And at the moment, they have you know 190 billion in cash and 140 billion in, in debt. So that suggests that they've got another you know 50 odd billion, 55 billion to return to investors. They are generating you know 100 billion in free cash flow every year. So there's a lot of money mm. that Apple can return to investors, and that's clearly something that's quite attractive. Alex, if you're looking to get excited about where new earnings are going to come from, from Apple, is it around the pandemic driving up sales of the stuff they've made for a long time and will continue to make more and more of? Or is it about service revenue? Or is it about the newer stuff around virtual reality, around electric vehicles and the like? Where's the excitement? I mean, fundamentally, the reason people invest in Apple is perhaps for non-exciting reasons, that yes, there's that services business. The real effect of that is that it ties people more closely to their Apple devices. So it means that Apple will continue to sell iPhones and iPads and Macs because everybody has apps and iCloud and photos all stored within Apple's ecosystem. There is the prospect of new products coming in the next perhaps five years. Uh, we know that they're working on some sort of augmented and virtual reality products. I recommend people read Mark Gurman's coverage on that. Uh, mm. That is something it's unclear it's going to be a big business anytime soon, even if they were to launch product this year. The car, yet again, very unsure when that'll come. It doesn't look like it's going to be a significant volume business anytime soon. We don't even know where they're going to manage to crack the technology that they want to. So there is the dangle of, of hope that there might be something coming up in a few years. But ultimately, the thing that investors know is that iPhone users are going to continue to buy those products. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Alex Webb there of Bloomberg Opinion. Also, shout out to Mark Gurman, who writes the Power Up newsletter. Definitely recommend you subscribe to that. Let's take a look. Well, if you're interested in Apple, that is. Let's take a look at what else uh, we're watching. I'm watching the COVID numbers. More than a million new cases reported in the U.S. yesterday. That's the highest daily global record now. And you can bet that that underestimates uh, by factors how many people actually um, became po COVID positive yesterday because most people won't really report it to any kind of health uh, professional. The reason I'm watching so closely is because this is my last day in the Berlin studio. I'm getting ready um, to pack up my stuff and head to the airport and fly into the uh, eye of the storm, so to speak, and I will be wearing a mask. <laughs> uh, Matt, we're definitely wishing you safe travels. But hey, if you wanted to fly a few more hours west, you'd get into what I'm watching for the day ahead, and that's the Consumer Electronics Show, which of course is happening yes. in Las Vegas, which is, you know, a little bit different than New York City. Uh, it is hybrid this year. It was all virtual last year, so perhaps uh, also progress. It's also one day shorter because we've seen a lot of these big name vendors bow out. Metaverse, that's expected to be a big focus. Anna, just a shame the Metaverse wasn't up, up to snuff enough to host CES there. Yeah, that would have been that would have been a, a, a real a real selling point, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I'm watching the OPEC Plus meeting. We talked about this with our guest a little earlier on. Really watching China. I know it's not a member of OPEC Plus, but watching the role of the Chinese consumer as the zero tolerance to COVID policy continues in China. OPEC very attuned to what the demand situation is going to look like this year. Yes, we know the pressure from the White House, but what is the China story? What is OPEC's assessment of the China story? I think that's going to be crucial and really interesting to watch as that develops this year. That is what we are watching. More Bloomberg surveillance is ahead. We hear from Kumar Galhotra, Ford Americas and International Markets Group president, among plenty of other fascinating conversations still to come. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>